The thing that has always struck me about Wes is how incredibly hardworking he is. He's the kind of guy who you can always count on to answer the phone no matter how late you call. Uh, he answers his own phone. You know, you can always get right to Wes. Uh, I think he clearly is at the uh, head of his field in, in Canada. He's not afraid to challenge the experts. So you'll often get into a room where um, obviously you have your proxy solicitor, you have your proxy advisor such as, such as Wes in the room, and you might have four or five lawyers in the room. And, um, and, and so you're you know, putting your plan together and the lawyers might give you a certain opinion. And he's not afraid to just say, you know, well, that might be a legal opinion, but in reality, uh, here's what I think you should do. Wes from the past is the Wes of today. There's no differences in that man. Watch out for, watch out for uh, vehicles like these that... These are taxis, actually. The best way to get around the island is by motorcycles, like what this guy is. Well, I actually grew up in uh, St. Thomas, uh, Jamaica, which is uh, this uh, beautiful place in, uh, right behind me. And I uh, stayed here from uh, ever since I was, uh, I, I was a child, I could remember. This is, uh, this is Golden Grove. You know, um, this is really the start of the town where, uh, and between here and the gas station, which is essentially less than a square mile, that's where everybody in this town actually lived their life. And uh, this is the major highway that goes through, uh, through this, uh, the town. And, uh, and, and everything really happens uh, from, uh, you know, Anyone going, coming from Kingston to the other side of the island actually has to get through here. So it's kind of interesting uh, if you stay around here long enough and you actually look at the kids and these cars going really fast and the kids playing soccer and running across the street. And it's amazing that uh, nobody actually, actually dies. Well, like anything, you know, when you're, um, when you're poor, that, uh, you know, food, <laughs> you know, making sure that you have enough uh, to eat. Uh, making sure that uh, you're, uh, you go to school and uh, that you have uh, enough in your stomach so that you can concentrate on learning. And uh, so those were the, uh, the struggles that, that, that we had, but we also had chores that we had to do around the house to make sure that we catch, uh, uh, get water um, before we go to school uh, to ensure that uh, the place is uh, kept clean, the house is kept clean. Uh, but, uh, and also to help out uh, my grandmother in the, uh, in the bush uh, when she went to plant her, uh, her yams and bananas and stuff like that, we had, uh, we had to assist her uh, in doing those things. So those were uh, quite interesting. I think that um, you know, when you're uh, you know, five, six years old and, and having to do those things, it's a part of life for us, but looking back at those things, um, one could look at it and say it was very, very difficult, but uh, for us it was just a part of life. This is really how how people actually live, you know, this is how they, you know, these are the beautiful uh, houses, as you can see, people actually plant flowers and uh, really try to take care of, uh, care of the houses. It's nothing special, but uh, it's really pride that they take in, uh, in, in looking after the little place that they have. Well, in this environment, you know, it was, uh, um, it was interesting because, uh, as you can see, uh, the place is, uh, is not the, uh, it's not the Ritz. It's not growing up in the, uh, living in the Ritz-Carlton. It's, uh, it's, you hear uh, roosters in the background, you see dogs running around, you see pigs in, on the loose. And, uh, but uh, one of the things that I can always remember was that uh, I always had love because uh, I had the most amazing 
uh, parent figure, which was my grandmother, who actually uh, made sure that uh, all of us was uh, properly looked after. So I had nothing but fun memories of, uh, of this environment. This is my sister Joan, <laughs> and my cousin Janet, and uh, Joan is getting herself all, uh, all printed up for, uh, for our party later on, I think. <laughs> I like here because I born up there. I born in one of the hosts up there and went to Winchester. And I'm, I'm 49, I'm 50 July coming, and I live here. I'm li I live here all those times from my grandmother bring me back here until now. And I don't live no other district away from Golden Grove. I go and call my when I live in Golden Grove. And I love Golden Grove. I love my district bad. I love my eye house. I love my house I, I love my eye house. Yeah. This is a, a spruced up version of, uh, of where uh, I spend my childhood in this uh, in this little house here, and uh, as you can tell, uh, you know these kids hanging out on top on, on the porch. That was that was me essentially back in the day. You know, uh, somebody coming here and I'm looking at wishing whether or not uh, I'm ever gonna, you know, make it out of this uh, this neighborhood. And uh, and and one of these kids could be the next. CEO of a very successful company at some point in the future. Uh, one of these could be the next president of, uh, of, of, of the Prime Minister of Jamaica and uh, or the next uh, Nobel Prize winners. We don't know. And uh, the fact of the matter is that if you uh, asked me about 40 years ago when uh, I was uh, a five-year-old uh, on that porch, what I would be, I'm going to be in Canada and I'm going to be running this uh, very successful company uh, I would, uh, somebody would say, it will never happen. And, uh, and here I am. So as I look at these kids uh, today, I often wonder, what will one of those kids become when they grow up? But all they need is really an opportunity. They want, they want to be given a chance to, to show that they can, uh, they can be successful. My grandmother, she was a nice, quiet lady, strict, beat, her, beat. My grandmother beat straight, because she, when she talked, and she ensured that um, you know we uh, we were respectful. Uh, so for uh, so she was my uh, she was my role model. Uh, she, in my view, she taught me how to be a man because uh, she she was never lazy. She was very industrious. Uh, so she made sure that um, she go out there and work. And uh, even at times when our fathers and mothers weren't really helping out at times. Uh, she was making sure that uh, that we're properly fed and looked after. My grandmother is my mommy. <laughs> my grandmother is my mommy. Everybody, mommy. My my grandmother had a kitchen, outdoor kitchen here, and uh, she would uh, she would make uh, uh, puddings and different things like that. She would bake them and she would sell them and that's really a part of how she would make her living. And uh, so we would, as kids, we would be like, it's, it seems like hundreds of kids because it's not just the grandkids that she would have to worry about, it's the neighborhood kids. As you can see, all these kids are not relatives of mine. They're essentially just kids from the neighborhood who just come here and hang out. So when I was a, a child with my grandmother, we used to uh, just hang out and wait for her to finish bacon and then she would give us the tin and then we would scrape the, uh, the sides of the tin out and would eat the, uh, you know, the, uh, the crust. And it was just the most uh, uh, amazing experience. So even though we were, we were poor kids, we were never in need of anything because my grandmother was such an industrious person that she worked so hard to make sure that, uh, that her kids are looked after, or grandkids are looked after, and that we'd never go, go to bed hungry. In fact, there are times when we didn't have much and she would actually uh, feed us all she had nothing for herself and she would just drink some hot tea and she'd go to bed and she'd get up at four o'clock in the morning and she'd start her day all over again. And uh, so I learned how to become a, uh, a person by just what I've seen from, uh, from my grandmother growing up and, and, and how to actually be compassionate, you know, making sure that you put other people in front of, uh, in front of you. You don't have to be old to pass away in this neighborhood. 
there's three to five years year old people who die because they're sick. In fact, uh, uh, my sister has been battling cancer for the last four years. Where's this upset about it, tail? Is where they take you? I'm, I'm diagnosed with cancer from 2000, from 2012. I diagnosed before that, but from 2012, I lose my breast. And it is Wesley. I pay 350,000 to cut off my breast. And it's Wesley who pay that money to cut off my diagnosis. All my treatment, everything. I go to Winchester Medical in Kingston of Alfred Tree. And it's Wesley who stand all of my bills. Wesley take care of me in every way. But everyone who developed cancer at the same time that she did, in fact, they're all uh, dead now. And the reason being is because of the fact that they can't afford medicine. You know, they can't afford the basic things that you need as a human being to get healthy. Uh, you know, there is uh, my sister would go to the, the doctor and she would be spending $100,000 Jamaican a pop just for the medication. Forget about the, uh, the, the, the treatment of, um, from the doctor and the different things that she has to do. Now, these people don't have 100,000 Jamaican dollars. 5,000 Jamaican dollars, they can't even put that together. So could you imagine that uh, you develop cancer and uh, you've been asked to buy some medication or you've been asked, uh, you've been told that you need chemotherapy and they tell you that uh, you now have to spend $100,000 a week uh, you know, for, for chemotherapy uh, treatment. And keep in mind that you don't even have $5,000 a month that you can put together. So essentially, the alternative that you have is you know you just got a death sentence uh, just by having a, 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 a disease that at the end of the day really could be curable uh, if, you have, uh, if you have the means to, uh, to, 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 to go to the hospital. Wesley, Wesley is my backbone. God up there and then Wesley. Wesley is my pride and joy. He make me feel happy, he make me feel good. Even when I sick and I call him, I can feel even when I'm talking to me, I can hear the voice saying, feel it. I understand? So, Wesley is everything to me. Wesley take care of me. And when he must send money come, he not really like him say, he must send five dollars come give me a ten dollars. He just send me money through the bank. To take care of my sickness. He take care of my bills. He take care of my food. He take care of my daughter, Crystal. He take care of my auntie. My auntie is sick and she take care of him. Anything happen to any one of the family members, they might call him and say, come have a cousin who diagnosed with cancer and die. And Wesley bury that cousin, send money come. First, he send money first to look after him in the hospital, had me in the hospital. And then he, when he couldn't go anymore, the doctor tell him, and he die, he send money back again to bury that cousin. So, Wesley's doing a lot, doing a lot, a lot for us. I miss the, um, the relaxed nature of life. Uh, people are naturally pretty friendly. Uh, they want to see, uh, see people just survive and, and, and get along. So I didn't remember it being a violent environment at all. I just remember people just wanting to, just wanting to get along and get by. And, uh, and for me, that was, uh, you know, whenever I come back here and it's almost like the place is stuck in time because that's the same attitude that I see up until today. Of course, uh, working on Bay Street it tends to be very stressful and very busy. And uh, every day is a fire drill. You, uh, you come to Jamaica and there's no such thing as a fire drill. And uh, you can actually feel the stress melt away from you as soon as you get off the plane. And especially when you come to this environment, uh, Bay Street is a distant memory when I'm sitting here because you look around you and you see what people struggle with. Uh, it just makes what we worry about on a day-to-day -day basis uh, pales in comparison. I came here September 27, 1985. That's a day when you ask any immigrant person, what day did you immigrate to Canada? Uh, they'll tell you the actual day. The date, the year, they'll tell you everything. 
because especially when you ask a poor person, when did you leave poverty, right? Because that's really what happened. As far as I could remember, when I was uh, growing up, my, my grandmother was, was always there. You know, she was, um, I, I just remembered uh, my early years of uh, not seeing a mother around or seeing a father around. When I was about, uh, I think I was about 11 years old, uh, my mom uh, came to, uh, to, to where, where, where we're living and she told my grandmother that she's actually gonna take me to, uh, to live with her in, uh, in the city, uh, in Clarendon. And uh, at the time I was really sad. I just, I, first of all, I didn't know this person. And I just remembered uh, that the, the, the sadness I felt of le leaving my grandmother behind, even though she had a lot of kids and my siblings were still there. And I didn't really know why I was chosen, why me? I subsequently found out later on that it's because my dad actually uh, insisted to my mom that you need to get Wes and bring him to where you were to, uh, to look after him. And I also realized that my dad was providing child support uh, at the time, which, uh, which, which I wasn't aware of any of those things at the time. But I remember feeling very, very sad that day. It was one of the saddest days of my life uh, when I actually left uh, to go live with my grandmother. One would think that, oh, you're happy now. You get to live with your mom. But again, my grandmother was the only mother I knew at the time. So for me, uh, I called her mom, actually. We all grew up calling uh, my grandmother mama. And uh, until she, the day she died, we called her mama. So I remember going to my, my mom's place and, uh, you know, uh, living with my, my, my mother and my stepfather. And uh, I had two step-siblings that, uh, that I, we lived with at the time. And it was just very different. It was, uh, my, you know, it was a very, very abusive household. Uh, my, my mom was very abusive to, uh, to, to myself and in particular my stepsister. Uh, physical, uh, uh, physically, uh, lots of uh, scars and bruises and uh, visits to the hospital uh, that I can remember at that age. And uh, I ran away. I remember the first time I ran away to my, my grandmother's house. I had no idea where I was going, but I went into, the, into town and uh, I caught a bus. I had no idea how I paid for it all uh, because I was like, you know, 11, 12 years old. And I found myself uh, traveling, uh, to get into Kingston, switching buses, and ended up in St. Thomas, which is just on the other side of the island. And uh, and my, I remember my grandmother saw me and said, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "I'm coming, coming back home." And uh, and she's like, "You can't just come back home like that. You're now living with your mother." I said, "Yeah, but I don't want to live there anymore. I want to live here with you." And uh, she, uh, uh, I remember a few days later, my grand, my mom came. And it was this big commotion. I, I went away, I ran away and hide. I hid in a cane field. And, uh, and everybody was hiding me because uh, they, I, I just told them what, what the situation was. And they said, listen, you can stay. And, and then she made a big commotion. Uh, and, and finally, uh, I had to go back to, uh, to live with her again. And uh, I think it, it taught me a lot in my life. It, it, you know, when I saw uh, the physical abuse, my, my stepfather was an alcoholic and uh, he was abused my mother physically. And at the time as a child, I really couldn't do anything about it. I remember just her in a room screaming and hearing him outside and not being able to help or do anything about it. And then he would finish with her and then he would turn, to, turn on us. And I remember at uh, 13, you know, after just uh, all the, the years of, uh, of uh, physical abuse, at 13, I remember uh, she, she, was, uh, she, she hit me a couple of times and I did nothing. I didn't cry, I, I just looked at her. And she, uh, and, and she did it again and I did nothing. Because before all these years I would cry, as soon as she would say rough things or say, just raise her voice, I, would, I was one of those really soft kids that, that, would, just, uh, that would just cry. And, uh, and, and, she, uh, and she did it a few times, she hit me a few times and I just kept on looking at her, no tears, nothing. And she said, uh, okay, you're a man now. And uh, she said, if you're a man, you, you should be on your own. And uh, so she packed my bag. It was a straw bag. I remember it like it was yesterday. And, uh, and she packed with it all my stuff. She threw it outside and she said, you're on your own now. And uh, so I was 13 years old, so I moved out. Uh, it was liberating for me. 
because uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know where I was going to live. Uh, I, and I, uh, I, but I packed, I took my bag with me and I left. I left uh, at 13 years old and I pretty much started to, uh, to, to fend for myself ever since then. I lived with a really great family uh, for a period of time, uh, for about a year uh, before I came to Canada. I was, uh, they had a lot of kids, uh, but uh, one of my classmates uh, uh, lived with this family and uh, told them about my situation and, uh, and they said, listen, won't you come live with us? So I spent a year uh, living with them. And then I got a call from my, uh, from my mom. I think I ran into her in, 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 in town and she told me that uh, my dad uh, wants me to come live with them in, in, in Canada. But uh, I had to do all the paper, uh, she, she's gonna look after all the paperwork, but there are certain rules that she established that, uh, and she said, if you don't follow those rules, that uh, you're not allowed to, she's gonna destroy the paperwork and you'll never leave Jamaica. And one of the rules that she established was that uh, uh, she, for some reason, she resented the, uh, the people that actually put me up. I don't know if it's because they, she, they, they looked after me. But she said, you're not allowed to tell them that you're leaving the country. And if you do tell them and she find out, that's it, the paperwork destroyed and you'll never leave. And uh, you know, as a 16 year old kid, um, I, I, I actually believed that because I felt this was my only out. And uh, another regret that I had was that I didn't tell that family until the day before I left to come to Canada, that, uh, that I was leaving Jamaica. And uh, I, I went back and I apologized to them years later for that. And, uh, but, you know, at the time it was, uh, I just felt that uh, I had no choice. And at 16 years old, when you receive a threat like that, and, and I knew she had all the cards, I followed through. came to Canada, uh, I remember coming off the plane and um, you know, walking through the airport and really seeing just the luxury, the shops, people walking around, the multiculturalism, and uh, going through immigration. I was by myself, I was 16, I was by myself and uh, with my little bag, you know, and uh, dressed to the hilt. My sister criticized me now about my, the outfit that I was wearing because I thought it was just the outfit because I spent all the money I had to buy this outfit to come here. And, uh, and walking through and I remember seeing my, 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 my siblings for the first time. My, my, my dad and my stepmom and, and, and my, my brothers and sisters uh, that I've never met uh, for the first time and uh, going in their vehicle and driving on the highway and seeing all these cars and everything and going into their house and just, you know, having, having a bed that's, uh, you know, that's kind of my own and uh, getting up in the morning and having breakfast with all these people around me that I really didn't, didn't know anything about and they didn't know anything about me. When he came to Canada from Jamaica, he was 16, quite shy. But after a couple of months, he began to adjust uh, very well because of his uh, other sibling. And so from then on, he was just a normal guy. What I know, what I see when Wes was Younger, 16, 17, that's when I know him. And um, he was uh, like any other young kid, um, just coming from home, from Jamaica. He wasn't as familiar with the environment that he came into, but um, he wasn't scared. You know, he was, um, I, a few days after I, I met him, I says to him, I says, you will go far. Because he wasn't afraid of approaching anything. I would say the first week when he came, 
I, I, I told him that this country is a dedicated country and I bring him here for, I said roughly two things, for him to graduate from school, work hard, make himself a man. And I said, well, uh, I didn't bring you here for you to support me, yet. At the time I said, yet but work hard and make yourself a man. I came here on a Friday, and on the Monday I was in school, right? My dad was, a, was very, very strict when it comes to education, so I had no time for a break. So, uh, so but, you know, when I, when I think back, you know, you look at uh, the people, people are right when they say, you know, Canada is just, uh, the streets are lined with gold. They're just golden opportunities. Tons and tons of opportunities here. Uh, so in comparison to where I was, and what I experienced when I came, it was just night and day, night and day. So I went to school. I, 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 I was enrolled into, into school prior to getting here. And I went to school, uh, Lester B. Pearson High School in, uh, in Scarborough. And uh, again, seeing the same thing that I've saw, I saw at the airport, the multiculturalism, and going into class and, uh, and, and sitting there with my books and now learning a completely different curriculum that I was used to in, in Jamaica. And, uh, and I remember the first time when, he, uh, as an eager beaver, you know, the teacher asked a question and I go, I know the answer to that. And I put my hand up, stuck it up high and, and they said, Wes, what's, what's the answer? And I gave the answer and uh, this long answer and everybody just started laughing. And I go, why are they laughing? because they couldn't understand my accent because I have this very, very strong Jamaican accent and nobody could understand what I was saying. As far as speaking and his adjusting to speak is, I said, learn to speak like him. That is my other son because that guy born here. I said, learn to speak like him. But if they're doing anything bad, don't do it. Let your head tell you. Don't do what they do, but just learn to speak like him. Eventually, uh, being, uh, I realized that uh, the kids actually appreciated the accent because they didn't really have too many people that were fresh off the boat from Jamaica. And then I became cool uh, in school and kids wanted to hang out with me. And then all of a sudden I would put the accent on even stronger. Instead of trying to get rid of it, I would put it on stronger. Later on I worked on getting rid of it, but, uh, but initially those uh, few years was, I was kind of like, uh, everybody wanted to be my friend. Uh, whenever they had these, they used to have these uh, concerts uh, in school and international day concerts where they would have, uh, because they had kids from all over the world that, uh, that were in that school. So they would have these international day events where they would have you go up and represent your, uh, your country. And uh, so I represented Jamaica by, uh, by, by doing a, a reggae rap. The school that, that I was in was called uh, Pearson, Lester B. Pearson. And, uh, and, and there was this mall that everybody would go to. Uh, it's called the Town Center in, in Scarborough. And, um, and, you know, but we all took the bus and we'd go to Scarborough. And I said, you know, I, I was, I was, it was, and when you do raps, it's gotta be, you know, in the moment. You, you just gotta come up with, uh, with stuff, like whether it be, you know, American style rap or whether it be Jamaican reggae rap, you just come up with stuff in the moment, you know. And I remember I was sitting there and, uh, and I said, Around Pearson, there's a lot of bus stop. One Nielsen, one Topscott, one Nugget and one Milner, and the whole of them in up at the town centre. So I was walking to school, walking to school and just cold. And I remember one day I got up and I went outside and it was just so cold. I just, I just couldn't go out there. You know, he's coming from Jamaica where it's hot. You know, he doesn't have to deal with this cold and the snow. And I, I, went, I went to my neighbor next door and he worked night shifts. And, uh, and I said, uh, Tony, uh, could you drive me to school, please? This man was working, come from a night shift and just went to bed. Right, and the poor guy, uh, you know, even though he worked nights, he got up, didn't complain. He's like, no worries. And he actually drove me to school. West can do anything he wants to do. He just face it, he's not afraid. It's either yes or no. But then I have to, 
I can't ask him to drive me to school every day. And, and I couldn't even tell my dad that uh, I had the neighbor drive me to school. They would just, <laughs> he would not be thrilled about that. So, but I had to get, I had to get, get used to it and I had to realize that this is it. So I remember complaining, like, why are the trees dead? Like, because they have no leaves on them. And they're dormant. I didn't know that they're going to come back later on. But I said, like, why do we have these trees? I left Jamaica. The trees are green. They all have leaves on them. And I come to Canada, and the trees are all dead. So I've always had jobs. You know, I had a, a, a paper out when I was younger, uh, when I was living at home with my dad. I make sure that when he came, he and his brother do the delivery of um, the Toronto Star, which was at that time a very hard job in this neighborhood because there was um, no sidewalks at the time because we first moved here and it was construction and mud really and he, he go and do it. So those are some of the, 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 uh, the trademarks that you could sort of look at and see that he will, you know, work hard. My my dad, you know, was, um, uh, he, you know, I didn't I didn't know him per se until I was uh, 16 years old, and uh, and unfortunately, I didn't give my dad the opportunity to turn me into the man that he that he envisioned that I I, I would become or could become. Um, at um, you know, at 18 years old, I, I moved out from, from home. And, uh, you know, in those early days between 16 and 18, my dad was trying to give me something that I never had before. I never had a structured family environment. I had my grandmother who loved me to death when I was, uh, when I was younger, up until 11 years old. And then I went, I went into a household that I didn't think had, didn't have any love for me. And, uh, and then I spent a year in that house uh, with, uh, with my friend's uh, uh, family that were just great people. And then, but, but between the, the years 13 uh, to, I would say, to 15, because I spent that one year in that, that house, between 13 to 15, I was really on my own. I was paying my own bills. Uh, I was going to school. Uh, because I wanted to, not because someone was telling me that I had to do that. I was buying my own clothes. Uh, you know, so I was really, in my view, I was a man at the time, and I was really f finding ways to make a living, like, you know, selling things, whether it be peanuts on the street and so on. So I was doing whatever I need to do to, uh, to survive, and I was going to school at the same time because I felt it was very important to do that. So when I came to live with my dad, my dad now said, this is a structured family environment where we have dinners together at a certain time in the evenings. Uh, there's lights out at certain times uh, at night. And there's certain time in the morning that you have to get up. And there's certain time that you have to get, get home from school. Like school would end at, uh, at 3.20. And because we were so close to school by 3.30, I had to be home. And if I wasn't home at 3.30, uh, I would be in trouble, big trouble. And uh, so, I, I, you know, whereas my friends were hanging out after school, watching the basketball games, watching football games, gambling, doing all those things, I wanted to do those things with them. I couldn't. And I had to explain to them why I had to go home when they didn't have to go home. He said, that sat I instilled in him, and I said, trouble is not my thing to everyone. You know, don't get yourself in trouble because my name is important. So I felt that was incredibly restrictive, incredibly restrictive coming from an environment whereby I called my own shots 100% to now having someone calling it off for me. Uh, and I really rebelled against it. And uh, at 18 years old, I, I, I packed my bag and, uh, um, and I, I didn't tell my dad I was moving. I just left and uh, I never went back home. Like any other kid, they have this agreement. Uh, maybe that's why he left home earlier than he did, than he should have. But um, it didn't stop him from communicating with his dad. We still communicate with him, and 
And if he needs advice, he still call him and they talk. I thought that he was more like on his own at an early age back home. He was like, I think. So it kind of, he liked that independent of. Uh, years later, obviously, I, I regretted that decision because I knew what my dad was trying to do to me or for me. I, I think as uh, there was a lot of my friends in high school at the time that spent time in jail that were getting into a lot of trouble. And there were friend, uh, kids who came from Jamaica in the early years and, and uh, they just got into a lot of trouble and my dad didn't want me to go through the same, go down the same path. So he was incredibly restrictive and, uh, and, and, I, and I, but I did appreciate the fact that he was a hardworking person. He, uh, he, he, he manned up to his responsibilities, right? Because he had me and, and another one of my siblings in Jamaica. He eventually took both of us to live with him and he took care of us, you know? So whereas a lot of uh, uh, Jamaican men who fathered children in Jamaica and left, that's it, they forgotten about their children and those children are left to fend for themselves. I see that with my own uh, sister in Jamaica, has six kids with six different uh, father, and all six fathers are gone, never to be seen or heard from again. Uh, so I really appreciated the, uh, what my dad did by remembering his responsibility, and at the right time or at the time that he felt was appropriate, he actually said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you to come live with me right now. And it was, uh, that changed my life, that, that decision changed my life. Just one. At least one. you got a one. When I take oh, this, I need a six now. Little Bubba. Three. Oh, I got a six. Yeah. I get it. If anybody else gets a six, I'm taking it. Just saying. Go ahead, Bubba. Six. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, Scott. Sorry. Well, when I first met West, he was uh, 21, um, so he was young. He's carefree. He's fun. Um, great dresser. And I always thought he was a little bit arrogant, <laughs> a little conceited. But as I uh, got to know him, I really realized that it was just his. He was confident. People always ask me how I. Uh, did you meet your wife? And uh, there's a story, there's a show that's uh, called How I Met Your Mother. And so it's just about how I met my wife. I, you know, it's not at a bar or, or at a restaurant or anything like that. It's the good old fashioned way, which is. I met him at uh, our Kingdom Hall at worship, and our uh, brother in law introduced us to each other. Uh, my grandmother always say that if you really want to meet uh, a good, wholesome woman, you got to do it at a good, wholesome place. And uh, so uh, church was that place. Uh, we, we both uh, shared the same religion. Uh, she was raised uh, uh, a Jehovah's Witness. I became one later on in life. And uh, I, was, uh, I, was at, uh, I was there, saw her and uh, asked her out. And I went out to, went, went to dinner at, uh, um, at a restaurant uh, in the city. And then uh, after dinner, I said, uh, why don't you just go for a walk to the boardwalk? It's no big deal, no strings attached, we're just going for a walk. So I went down to the boardwalk uh, on the waterfront uh, for a walk. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, her hands, uh, her hands touching each other and she didn't really resist. And next thing you know, it turned into a clasp. And uh, that's, the day, that's the day we started dating. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Oh, so cute. <laughs> that was cheesy. <laughs> I must say. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> you know, we had uh, a point when Christine and I, when we just got married, because we're young. Christine was 19 years old. I was 22 years old when we got married. So we're building a life together. I remember when I, uh, when I engaged to her and I bought her uh, her engagement ring, it was a year's salary that I used. I saved up to buy it. You know, it was, it was just, uh, I wasn't making anything. And I just, but I wanted to give her the best I could give her. And I look at that ring now and I go, she loves it, by the way. I've bought her a number of gifts since then. 
and uh, and for some reason that ring keeps getting pulled out and uh, because she remembers what it meant and that uh, you know all the the, the situations and surround, uh, circumstances surrounding it uh, but we had you know we had three kids on the tree and uh, we just didn't have enough money and there are times when we every week every other week when I get paid and there would be a negative in the account there's all the, you know my paycheck would go in her paycheck would go in and we're still in overdraft and we'd have to pay overdraft to the bank like time and time and time again so and and that went on for years right the kids when you have when you have three kids on the three there's a lot of diapers a lot of things that you buy that are disposable that you have to buy every single week i would say our first year of marriage was was interesting it was uh 1992 uh, June 6, 1992, we got married, and a month later, again, my wife 19, me 22, a month later, we literally got a call from the airport uh, from my mom, my biological mom, saying that we're here. And I say, where are you? We're here. We're here at the airport in Canada. What airport in Canada? Pearson Airport in Canada. You need to come get us. And, uh, and I remember going downstairs and said to my wife, my... Uh, I just got a call from my mother. She's here, and I got to go pick her up at the airport. And I went to pick her up, uh, brought her, brought my two sisters and my two brothers, five people. After we've been married for four weeks, and uh, we had a whole family <laughs> living with us in our little two-bedroom apartment. It didn't really take long uh, before things really changed uh, really badly for us uh, because my my brother immediately, and he, he was the exact same age when I came to Canada, but he took a different path. Immediately, he started to get into trouble. He would get into fights all the time. He would hang out in the wrong neighborhoods in town. He would, um, he would come home and uh, late at nights, I would sit him down, but I'm a, I'm a sibling. You know, he, my, my mom had zero control over him. I didn't know that he was getting into these troubles when he was in Jamaica. She didn't tell me all those things. And now I had to become a father to him. I was 22 years old. And, uh, and tell him, you know, really put down structure when he should be coming home, when he should be doing things. And he really rebelled against it. He would steal cars. He would sell, you know, uh, whatever he would sell. He, he went to jail a few times, so I assumed that he was, uh, um, you know, hanging out to the wrong crowds, maybe selling on the street, uh, who knows. But uh, I remember getting calls at 2 o'clock in the morning from the police station uh, to, uh, to, 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 to get him out because he would be arrested for different things. I didn't even know he was out. And, uh, and eventually, because of all the things that he was, that he was doing to Canada, they, uh, he was uh, deported back to, to Jamaica. My older brother uh, was a different story. He started to work, but I remember him sitting down and saying to me because I would you know, even though I was dressed, uh, was working in the mailroom, I always carry myself well, wear a tie to work and, uh, and so on. And I remember him saying to me, you know, I, I can't do things the way you do. You know, I can't work in, in that type of environment the way that you can. And I said, listen, it's, it's a living and that's what's keeping the roof over our heads and keeping you fed, you know. And, uh, and, and he just said, listen, I just find it difficult to, to work like that. And then Eventually, he, he came back to me and he said, listen, I'm leaving, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm moving out, I'm going to the States. And uh, he left. And then I, was, I heard later on that uh, he was involved in selling drugs. And I remember I was in Jamaica and he was there. And he was living in Florida at the time. And I said to him, Ian, you really need to stop. And you need to just, just that's, that's, there's no upside for you doing this. It may look good now, you're making money, but there's no upside. Why don't you come back to Canada and live with me for a while again and get yourself back on, on, on the right track? And he said, yes, uh, you know what, Wes, I, I am. I'm kind of sick and tired of this stuff, and I'm going to do that. And um, he called me up uh, one day when he went back to Florida, and he said he's going he's, he's to come over, and he's going to make a stop in Buffalo and uh, uh, on his way back to see me. And um, I received a call uh, from Buffalo, and uh, it was uh, uh, from the coroner's office. 
and they said that uh, we found a body and uh, we found uh, uh, your phone number and it, it identified you as a sibling and uh, would like for you to come and identify the body. And I said, what's the name of the person? They told me the name. I was devastated. It was my brother that they told me that they found his body. And um, I remember calling my, my older sister and I said, let's go to, um, let's go to Buffalo to, uh, to, identify, to identify him. Drove uh, to Buffalo. It was the worst neighborhood. The police station had barricades on, on, on the doors and on the windows. And it was in the worst neighborhood uh, in, that I've ever seen. And I remember uh, they took me to the, uh, the coroner's office, uh, to the morgue, and they pulled, uh, they pulled the body out and, uh, you know, my brother was lying there. And uh, they described what happened. Um, they found him, uh, he was beaten, his legs were tied uh, together, his hands were tied behind him. They put a uh, plastic bag over his head, they tied it, and they threw him in a dumpster. And, um, and that's, uh, uh, that's how he died, and um, you know, for me, it was it was very difficult even till even today, because um, I kind of felt uh, responsible. Yeah, because I felt that if if I left him in Jamaica, he would be he'd be alive today. He would be alive today if, if I left him there. And that was it. We, uh, we buried him. And I had to call my grandmother and told her that he died. It was the worst call that I had to make. Just like my, uh, I thought my dad feared about me, and that's why I really respected my dad because he kept me away from the things that I was unable to keep my brother away from. I mean, it was tough, um, but I think Wes really learned, and you know, to this now when I look at you know, his relationship with his dad, he didn't necessarily see eye to eye with him then, but he really appreciates that that guidance and direction. I know Wes would never forget that, and because of that. Um, I think it drives his, I think that that debt was also a big driving force in Wes's life because Wes could have been that brother, you know, but he was determined he was never going to be that brother, right? He was going to be the brother that would uh, uh, never have to undergo those, uh, those circumstances, you know? And uh, he would be the brother that would help other brothers rather than um, be one who uh, come to an unfortunate that, you know. So, uh, so I think there was some major uh, influences like most people, right, that shaped them. I remember the, the first time I, I, was, I went to Bay Street. I was actually working in the uh, mailroom of a law firm. And I went upstairs, uh, they were on the, uh, the, the 13th floor, which is not a very high uh, office tower, but they're on the 13th floor. And, uh, and I walked in and I saw these beautiful paintings and this huge reception area. And these people were in fancy suits and, uh, and it was just like, it was just, wow, this is amazing, right? Just like I'm watching a television program. And I remember my first day on the job, I actually wore a suit in the mailroom and everybody else was wearing jeans and t-shirts. And they look at me and go, what are you doing? And I go, you know, what? I'm showing up to work. They go, the people are gonna think you're a lawyer. I said, well, maybe one day I will be. But for now, this is how I'm gonna dress. I'm gonna dress just like everybody else. And uh, I didn't have a lot of money, but uh, I had a very nice suit, very nice shoes. 
I wear a suit and tie every day to deliver the mail. And, and, and that kind of tells me from earlier on that that was not my destination. The mailroom was not my destination. Being a guy in a fancy suit in a boardroom was my destination. And I actually pretended that I was in my mind as I would go by these fancy offices and I see these guys with their feet on their desk uh, having big conference calls. I would go, one of these days, I'm going to meet that corner office. And eventually, the, I realized that the company had a program whereby they would pay your, your, uh, your dues to go to school in the evenings and, uh, and to take additional courses, if you, uh, whatever those courses may be. So I said, you know, I would like to be a lawyer one day. So I decided to start taking the law clerk's course at uh, George Brown College, and the company actually paid for it. And I would do that in the evenings and, and took the course. I graduated, I, um, uh, I was successfully, successfully completed the course, and then I wanted to uh, get promoted within, so I kept on going to the right people and asked them if they would, could you, you know, hire me, now I have this course and this certificate, could you, could you hire me, and uh, no, we, you know, we're not looking for any help in this department, and, but I would actually voluntarily ask to help out in different areas that I could on my own time, when I have downtime in the mailroom. And then finally this position came up uh, in the department called Corporate Records Department where I get to maintain all the closing books. I decided that I, I would like to do that job on a full-time basis, but there was no position available at the firm. So I started to apply to all these different uh, firms uh, for a law clerk's position. And then I got a call from one of the firms uh, who mentioned that they don't have anyone, they're not looking for anyone. However, they do have a client that was uh, looking for a law clerk, and that client happened to be Canvas Global. Well, it was a really interesting situation. It was one where we were doing some recruiting, and um, uh, a colleague of mine uh, at Can West, where I was at the time, had indicated that uh, she knew of somebody who was working uh, downtown at Steigman's, and uh, who might be interested in making a move. And they laid out the position, and it was this, it was a, it was things I've never ever done before. But I felt uh, I was very excited about the opportunity, A, to, to learn, to work for a company like, uh, like Lobo. We, we, we'd share a lot, we'd talk a lot. I think he saw in me somebody who um, was on the go and wanted to get things done, and we got along really well, and we were co-pathetic in that way. There was a lot of, um, of a good vibe between us. And then I got a call weeks later, and it was from uh, Glenn O'Farrell, and he said, uh, I'm gonna be in the city, I'd like to have drinks with you. And uh, he took me out, uh, we had drinks, we talked. He talked about the job, talked about me personally, he talked about himself. And uh, then he said, uh, I would like to, uh, I'd like to offer you the position. I think probably described himself as someone who thrives on new challenges. And um, he felt that maybe there were some that he could do uh, or he could find in the work that we were offering. You know when someone can't do something that you assign to them. And you also know when someone can do something that you assign to them. Clearly, he looked at my resume and he knew that I didn't have expertise in broadcasting. He knew I didn't have expertise in reviewing contracts for the, the NFL coming to Canada or commercial buys that they're going to do and so on. He knew I had no experience doing those things. Wes learns a lot by observing and he's a very good observer. He pays attention. And I think that it's more than just an intuitive skill. I think he's developed it into a very finely tuned skill of watching the way uh, environments are unfolding and what uh, is working and what's not working. I remember when I, when I um, at, at the time at uh, Canvas, I, I, I was doing very well there, and, but I felt that um, I, I, I needed to do more. And, uh, and I decided to look elsewhere, so I applied for a position at, uh, at uh, CIBC Mellon. Uh, and I was hired for that position, and it was going into an industry I knew nothing about, just like I moved to go to Can West. And um, I learned really quickly uh, and became very uh, successful in that position, and I was recruited to join Georgeson. And they were right size in the firm, they were bringing in new talent. They looked around, they heard about me, by, by my reputation. And I said, uh, I think you'd make a good fit uh, for our firm. I interviewed with, uh, with their management team and I was offered the position uh, to become uh, uh, the VP of uh, 
of business development. You know, it's built into Wes's DNA. He's not a complacent individual. Uh, he's always moving forward, and he just doesn't know any other way. In training, as his trainer, um, there's, there's multiple ways and systems you can use to train um, an individual, a client. With Wes, he likes to keep going. He doesn't like to stop. He doesn't like to waste any time. He doesn't like to have rest periods. And sometimes, depending on the weight load that we're doing, he doesn't quite get it. It doesn't always connect. He doesn't realize it's a certain weight load and we need to slow down because of this. He's, he's just so incredibly driven at such a high level that he just doesn't know stop or no. He just wants to keep on going. I literally have to grab him, hold him back. But um, so that's his attitude. Like you, you definitely see uh, the way he approaches training in the gym. It definitely translates and you definitely see that, that mirrored in his approach in the business world. When I decided, I didn't get up one day and said, I'm going to start my own firm. I was very happy at Georgeson. The company was doing well. But I thought there were a lot of uh, waste in the company, a lot of mismanagement. And uh, the lifestyle that they really was, uh, was encouraging wasn't one that was, was in my best interest and my family's best interest. You had to travel a lot. You have to entertain a lot uh, after work, entertain clients, hanging out with colleagues at bars and restaurants and so on. And uh, that was not conducive to the type of lifestyle that I really wanted for me and my family. And, uh, and eventually, uh, I remember my, my boss said to me that uh, that is gonna prevent me from moving up in the company. So I sat down and I started to write a business plan. Just right in it and uh, just you know I, 15 pages I put together with what I would do if I was going to start my own uh, firm, uh, who the people are that I wanted to hire in the firm, uh, what the, uh, the, the model should look like in comparison to, to the Georgia's business model, how, how different it should be, and uh, the financial projections, who are the, business, the companies that I wanted to do business with and would do business with me and I modeled it all out. And then I took it to a, a few institutions, took it to some banks, and I said, you know, I'd like to set up this firm. It's a proxy solicitation business in Canada, and uh, this is my competition, and here's my projection, and here's what I think I could do. And they all looked at it, and to the, every single bank looked at it and said, no, we're, we're not going to back this. Uh, so I went to my main institution, and uh, uh, in, 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 at CBC, and uh, I said to my, my manager, uh, uh, Lancelot, I said, Lance, uh, Lance is a Caribbean guy like myself. I told him what I was going to do. And uh, Lance said, uh, well, you know, maybe what you should do, because I don't think the bank will back this, but you, we can certainly support you by giving you a line of credit, and you can use your, your home to secure it. What do you think? I said, let me go home and talk to Christine. I talked to Christine about it, and she said, uh, yeah, what's the downside? And we talked about the downside. The downside is that if it doesn't work, I'm going to go back to work, or she's going to go back to work. We both go back to work, right? But that's the downside. What's the upside? The upside is I'm going to do something I love, and who knows, maybe I'll be successful at it. I wasn't able to get anyone from Georgeson to come with me. That was a part of my business plan that I was going to have two or three colleagues nobody came because they didn't want to take the risk and uh, and and also I talked to friends about it I remember when Wes uh, first wanted to go into business and uh, I knew exactly 
how much money he had because he told me. Wes doesn't tell a lot of people, um, doesn't share stuff like that, right? but he told me. And um, he said to me, Dave, do you think I should do this? This is a big risk I got. I've got kids. That's probably the only weakness I ever saw on, with Wes over the years. He says, Dave, I've got kids, I've got a family, I've got a relatively good job, right? This is how much I have, and I could lose it all. Uh, I totally second-guessed him and thought, I think you're making a big mistake here. I actually never told him that, but um, behind the scenes I was thinking, you know, what's this guy's deal? Like, is he got a, a, a delusions of self-grandeur? Does he think that much of himself? Is he, you know, arrogant? But it, it was none of those things. He's just uh, somebody that's extremely convinced of who he is in the world and what he wants to do and what he wants to achieve. And he, again, I placed the impediment on him. He didn't. And it wasn't arrogance. It was just a guy who was confident, extremely confident, driven, and just continued to push forward. The only person that uh, told me that, let's go, we, you know, stack hands and, uh, and, 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 and chanted, and it was, it was Christine. If you ask Wes, he's probably had every single job there is out there, and he's, you know, started businesses in, in the past, little businesses. And so it's something we had talked about, and I think as his work relationship, um, he wasn't, he loved what he, do, he did, he had a passion for what he did, but he, um, just the bureaucracy of business. So that's when he really started talking about thinking, you know, let's do something. We took the, uh, the line from the bank and uh, I resigned from Georgerson and I started Kingsdale. It wasn't an overnight success. It, uh, it took me a few weeks before I got my, few, my first transaction, but uh, it, was, it, it was something the market needed and I built it differently. Uh, again, that business model, that I, the, the business plan that I put together was not to emulate what Georgeson was doing, but to anticipate where I believed the market was going and then to bring people into the industry that could actually provide the expertise that I think the market will need for the future. So I was going up against Georgeson now and brand new, I'm by myself. I have, uh, I have no employees and a transaction was announced in, uh, in, in Canada and I was going after the deal. And I, I made an announcement, I, I, the announcement came out, I, I called the people that I knew at the company that w was involved in the transaction and they all said, listen, thank you Wes, I appreciate this, but uh, I think Georgeson is going to get this deal. And I remember the, the proposal that I sent to them. It was actually more expensive than Georgeson. However, it said if the deal fails for whatever reason, whether it be not getting shoulder support for it, or an interloper, a third party shows up to, uh, to bid a higher price than you guys walk away, if any of those things happen, I don't get paid. I get paid zero. And I remember the, uh, the finance manager for the, for the company involved in the deal called me up and said, I really appreciated this, however, we're not going to go with you on this one. And uh, I, I, I called up uh, Paul Stein. Uh, Paul Stein is a, is a lawyer at uh, one of the law firms here in Canada and a good friend. Uh, and it, it was his client that was involved in the transaction. And I said, Paul, uh, I'm trying to pitch this deal. They're not giving it to me. Um, what do you, uh, you know, what can you do to, to help me to, uh, to secure it? I think he did stand out from uh, the others that I met in that industry. Um, I can't explain to you why, but it was just, a, you know, a, something that appealed to me in terms of his personality and uh, his work ethic and, um, and the way he treated me. And he said, uh, you know what, you did an incredible, great job for these guys when you were at Georgeson because they had a stock option plan and uh, you were, they, they were having a problem getting it passed and when you were at Georgeson you single-handedly worked with them to get this option plan passed by 50.1 percent. So I think the CEO of the company remembers this and I think he potentially will uh, 
we'll give you a shot. So let me give him a call and let him know that you're now on your own. So he called the CEO, whose name was uh, Ian Telfer. And he said to, uh, to Ian, uh, he said, Telfer, he goes by Telfer, do you, uh, do you, you remember that guy at, uh, at Georgeson that helped us with the stock option plan? Yeah, he did a great job, Telfer said. Well, he's now on his own, and these guys are trying to squeeze him out of the business by undercutting his pricing. Do you want to give him a shot on this, uh, on this deal? Well, when we first started, we talked to a number of people that do the same job of getting shareholder votes. And, uh, but in the interview, he completely outshone the rest. And he was just starting out at this time. This was in 2002, I think, 2003. And so he was very excited and very motivated and very aggressive. And of course, then with his charm and his salesmanship, uh, it was an easy choice. Uh, Telfer called his guy, who then called me back and said, we're gonna give you a shot. In a couple of cases, we were trying to uh, merge with another company and there was a third company trying to uh, convince our shareholders not to vote for us. And so it was hard slogging and it was meeting by meeting and it was city by city and it was shareholder by shareholder. And as I say, Wes was with us every inch of the way. And because that's his business, he knows these shareholders from other uh, controversies. And so he's, he, he gives you great advice as to what you should emphasize, how you should address them, how you should appeal to them, what will motivate them to vote for you. And so uh, those are the kind of situations we were in, and he, his, his advice was invaluable. Now, luck of all luck, that deal failed. And keep in mind, my proposal said if the deal fails, you get nothing. The deal failed not because of my work, but because somebody else showed up to make a higher bid for that for both companies. And then uh, both companies were now were subject to a hostile takeover bid. And they, as, as a result of that, they walked away from a friendly merger. And the deal failed. I defended them against a hostile takeover. I defended the, the company they were, def they were working with against that hostile takeover. And even though it was successful, on the, uh, it was uh, failed on the merger, Ian gave me every single penny that I would have received on that transaction. And that became, that transaction became the best transaction ever for our firm. This was uh, started in 2004 and it kept us busy for close to three years with all the different changes that that company went through. And that, and that deal made Kingsdale into what it is today. So eventually, Georgeson looked at the market and, and said it's, it's just too competitive. Uh, Kingsdale, uh, obviously, being the number one brand in the country, were very dominant in the space. And uh, they just felt that they couldn't compete and they closed, uh, they closed down. So we went from, really, within a 12-year period of time, uh, going from a brand in, in the Georgeson brand, whereby they were just too dominant for anyone to compete with them, to 12 years later, they closed their doors because they couldn't compete. They were certainly a power in this space before Wes started. I knew he had worked there and uh, clearly he made the right decision to leave. He, he, like anyone in any large organization, he could probably see what they were doing that he would have liked to change and he wasn't going to be able to change it there. So he did the right thing, went out on his own and made those changes and clearly the market uh, embraced him. I would say that it's a, it's a test case and example for any service business in this country. Service businesses have their assets go up and down the elevators of their buildings every single day. And when that asset doesn't come back up the building the next day, your business is at risk. You lose a star like Wes, and God help you because it'll be very difficult, if not impossible, to replace him. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Wes was either very smart or very lucky, or maybe a bit of both. So Wes um, discovered the whole area of proxy solicitation back at a time when it wasn't especially important. Um, and it was something that people did for the odd contested meeting, the odd difficult takeover bid, you know, for annual meetings. But he hit his full stride at the time that activism, shareholder activism, hit its stride in the you know, Canadian capital markets. And so he was able to ride this enormous wave 
of shelter activism activity that created um, uh, the need for you know experienced advisors like West to guide boards and activists through the process. And then probably saw from there an opportunity rising and, uh, and then established the firm initially as a proxy advisor, uh, which you know generally could be fairly um, uh, non-combative. I mean, we're just care, uh, gathering proxy votes uh, and tabulating them uh, to um, you know something that is more today uh, an activity that when a fight starts, uh, he can represent one side or the other. And he saw that opportunity growing and he decided he would become an expert in it. And in effect, he has become an expert. Wes was a pretty aggressive uh, builder of a business. I mean, he saw an opportunity and he went for it. Uh, there was a niche, I think, available in the shareholder communications uh, sector space. I did a deal with, uh, with MDC Partners, uh, namely because they came to me with the perfect approach. We're gonna give you some cash, you're gonna take some money off the table, we're gonna give you the rest of the capital to grow the business and to fulfill your ambition of being an international player. Part of the reason for partnering with Wes and part of the reason why Wes partnered with MDC was our dedication and belief that the success that Kingsdale's experienced in, the United, in Canada could be replicated in the United States. And we feel very strongly, both organically as well as possibly through a platform acquisition, he will be able to succeed in the United States. When, I remember when I, when I met uh, MDC and, and Miles Nadal for the first time, I, can, I just see myself in him. I don't have this kind of money and, and stuff, but I just saw myself in him, right? He, was, he built something from scratch. He built MDC from scratch. And he went from, you know, not having a lot of people believing in what he was trying to accomplish to building it and all of a sudden, everybody thought he could do it. Uh, I love the fact that he's such a driven insurgent and he wants to, you know, go against conventional wisdom, etc. cetera. Um, he's, uh, you know, he's a person with incredible attributes on many levels, both personal and professional, that I relate to. Not because you have a partner doesn't really mean that you no longer can be entrepreneurial. So I was able to, I was able to so far, get a partner who allowed me to make the decisions that, I've always, that I was always making prior to them becoming a partner in a business. So if you look at the way Kingsdale is managed today versus uh, the way Kingsdale was managed prior to the transaction, there's no different. Uh, there's zero difference. I am still as hungry as I was before. I work harder now than I, than I, than I did before because I now have a bigger vision that I have to fulfill and I have five years to do it. Uh, not that there is any body putting a clock on me to say you have to do it within that period of time. I put my own clock on. I put my own five-year vision in place. And, uh, and, and my job is to, when I get there in five years, to say, I've accomplished it, what's next uh, for the next five years? So it was, it was difficult to, 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 to say this is no longer my baby 100%, but it's still my baby. It's just not 100%. What? Yeah, I broke it. Oh, the metal part just fell off the back. No, it can't come back up. Mm -hmm. no. Broke something again, I broke something again, I broke something again, I broke something. I tried to get Brent to tell me, he didn't. You threatened. Yeah, but what's the... My face is in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thank you, Andrea. You broke something. You can try, you can try the other way in there, possibly. Yeah. Oh, look at that, Kiana. Yeah. The mechanic man. <laughs> and then she just needs me to clean up her mess. <laughs> uh, my dad's sense of style is definitely like out there, but in a good way. Um, he loves like crazy socks, colorful socks, his ties and his pocket squares. And I think that's something really cool because um, like, especially in his profession, like you don't usually see that every day. So I think it's really, um, he likes to have a little fun and it shows through that. Part of his drive to militaristic excellence demands that his daily armor that he comes dressed in is also excellent. And so, um, yes, he dresses every single day in a manner that 
that makes him proud, that exudes confidence, and that I think tells his employees and partners that he means business. The way he dresses, uh, <laughs> yeah, he has a pretty uh, interesting uh, style. Definitely, definitely, uh, I think he takes pride in what he wears. He likes to spice things up, and and uh, it's you don't see you don't see that kind of that kind of style every day. But yeah, he definitely like. I think he finds it fun <laughs> to wake up every morning and see what he's gonna wear, put it together, go to the stylist, and see what what he can put together for him. Whenever I go to see Wes. I put on my absolute best suit, shirt, tie, shoes, smile, hair, everything. And then when I meet Wes, he completely outshines me every single time. My dad's sense of style, I think, is pretty funky. And he wears a lot of colors, so I like that. What sense of style? I don't think he's got any sense of style. I think he should get one. I think he's got to work on that. <laughs> I think he was born with a style. Christine showed me a picture of him as a little boy. He could be loud at times, right? Because, you know, like some of his shoes, right? You know, this one particular orange pair of shoes that he was wearing one time. Um, needed his shades a little bit, you know what I mean? <laughs> I had the good fortune to be invited to Wes's home for dinner. He lives in an absolutely spectacular home uh, in Rosedale. and. Um, and when you enter the house, there's what he calls the jewel box foyer. It's this stunning foyer, all glass, glass roof, glass walls. And there's nothing in it except this single life-size statue of kind of an abstracted human form. And it's, it's, a, it, it's a kind of version of a man, a black man, emerging from kind of farmhand dungarees into a suit with a briefcase. And it's all a single figure. And it's kind of... Wes Hall's story in his hallway and it's you know kind of Wes as told by Wes and it's the first thing you see when you come into his home and I think that says everything about Wes. Wes is a class act. Uh, I had a great experience with him. Uh, the, the thing I do, do regret is I don't have the occasions to work with him enough because you know he does transactions and intends to move on but I think that uh, I think our experience was wonderful with him. I think most other people have. I think he's been really successful coming from a background and I have some appreciation for that because I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth either. Um, and so, you know, he's just a, uh, what we kind of say down south, he's just a good guy. You can't pay him any more compliment than that. Now having understood uh, where he came from, it was obviously it's a great success story. Um, uh, he started from um, meager kind of beginnings and has uh, become a, what I, a very successful entrepreneur and uh, with uh, no end in sight in terms of his potential growth. So, uh, you know, I think a great individual and, um, you know, all the best luck to him in the future. I've watched Wes um, grow after we, our careers separated paths, and um, I've watched him uh, take on his new challenges, and I've been impressed every step of the way with that same um, demeanor that I recall meeting probably the first time I saw him, which was uh, he stayed very much the same person, uh, ultimately. And I think that's impressive because success sometimes does things to people. Second thing is, um, I continue to be very uh, admiring of his family values. Uh, I think that's a big part of who he is and how he defines himself. Um, and I think that it's a large part of his success story. So those are the two sh you know, parting comments I'd make. Uh, I'm, I'm proud, I'm impressed, and I'm continuing to see a guy who's true to himself, particularly as a family person. It's been one of the most blessed relationships and privileges that I've had in my career and my life to get to know Wes and his family. I think that the successes that Wes and his family have are actually still ahead for them. And I think that uh, the business community has just begun to hear about the successes of Wes and Christine. And I think that the philanthropic community 
has just begin to hear, began to hear about the successes and aspirations of Wes and Christine. And I say watch out because what this guy's done in an industry that nobody had even heard about 15 years ago, he could do to any industry. And I'm very excited about the chapters ahead. I, I'm definitely, you know, proud and I feel like we've accomplished it together. And he's, always, he's never just taken the success for himself to say this is what something I built. So I feel like it's something we've done together. And again, that it's really was a team, team effort. They're very, 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 very happy to see where he is. And sometimes even surprising myself. I expect him to exceed, excel, right? But he more than excel. He more than excel. Yeah, for a lowly boy come from Jamaica, he more than excel. I don't know the word to put to that one. Like just seeing where he came from, um, a lot of people would have just rolled over and gave up. I, like you see it all the time. Um, but he really tried hard to get where he was, which is part of the reason why I think a lot of people respect him. And obviously one of the reasons why you're doing a documentary about him, because he's one of those people that kind of broke the bear here, in my opinion, and um, really like, just put himself out there and it ended up paying off for him. I'm happy for his accomplishment and I hope um, he stays healthy so that he can enjoy more of his hard work. He and his family. Yeah. I am very, very proud of my father. He has an amazing story and he's accomplished so much in his life, so I think it's very amazing. I'm so proud of him. I'm proud of what he's done, what he's accomplished in life. Um, you know, it's not every day that you see someone come from a impoverished uh, town in Jamaica to the riches, so I'm very proud of what he's accomplished. I mean, even when I was in Jamaica the other week, um, he's pointing out his old friends. He's like, oh, this is Bob, this is Frank, whatever. And you can see he, he went to school with those people. And, and the difference between them is he's, he's moved on. He's made it to Canada and he's built himself a, a successful life. Um, whereas he could just, he, he could very easily be one of those, another, another one of those people just uh, hustling every day, tr trying, to, trying to get paid <laughs> and just trying, trying to get food on the plate at the end of the day. So um, yeah, I'm very proud of what he's accomplished and to see, to see what, he's, what he's done. I think achieving uh, the uh, uh, American Canadian dream, if you want to call it that, uh, I, I guess it's, um, it, it's, it's interesting because I've never really, I don't consider myself a successful person. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and people say, what do you mean? I, I just don't. I just, um, I, I, you know, I've worked hard and I've been rewarded for my hard work. But I don't walk around and go, man, I'm successful. You know, it's, it's, it's not something I think about ever. And maybe one day when, I'm, when, I, when I slow down, I'm going to think about it. It's almost like you're running the race in the Olympics, right? And if you're in first place, I don't think you're sitting there going, God, I can't believe I'm in first place. You know, when the race is over and then you start to watch the replay, then you're going to sit there and go, wow, I did really well. So I'm still running my race. I haven't watched a replay yet. At some point in the future, I'm gonna watch the replay and I'm gonna enjoy what I've done. But right now, I'm just running. <laughs>